Hello, I'm Christine. Welcome to Book Talk. Today we are discussing House of Breath and Sky. The day has finally fucking come. I finished Crescent City 2 last night. A year and three months after it came out, or a year and six months after it. It's been a long time. There's a lot of reasons why I didn't make it through this as quickly as I wanted to. The ultimate being the pressure to do this. Because I was so busy writing on deadline when this came out and just feeling the pressure of creating a book talk that lives up to all my other book talks just really got to me because I knew I didn't have time to do it the way I wanted. Now that pressure is finally slid off and I'm really just gonna take it easy today with this one. I'm not gonna kill myself doing this book talk, but I want to do it. This feels a lot like when I finished Mark of Athena because obviously I didn't read this the second it came out and everyone was like, Christine, Christine, just wait. If you haven't read it right now, I'm gonna warn you that I'm about to like just spoil what spoiled it for me, which was something very mild, but like I read a lot of books, so anything mild will lead me to what happens. So here we go with the mild spoilers that I got. Christine, you have to get to the end. Christine, you have to tape yourself when you read the last two chapters. Christine, film yourself while you're reading the last chapter. Christine, the end though. My first thought when you say that is what happened at the end, literally. So I spent the whole book thinking, I hope it's not that. I hope it's something else. And of course I theorized a million different other theories that I was like, this would be amazing. This would be so cool. Cool, because the other one felt like the most straightforward answer to the mild spoiler. And then it ended up being the straightforward answer and I ended up being like, nah. Roll tape. Did they just make fun to sleep again? Crescent City book is absolute perfection. Sarah knocked it out of the park in such a profound, beautiful way that hit you so hard from every angle emotionally. Okay, I just rewatched that book talk and Christine after that book, me past me is wrecked, okay? In the best way that you can be wrecked from a book. She had so much to live up to herself-wise in this book. I feel like it it's like that second book syndrome, that second season of Westworld syndrome where like there's just so much to live up to. You can't possibly do it. The pressure is so overwhelming. I feel like House of Sky and Breath suffered from that because there's so many characters that it's hard to find the heart. Sarah's so fantastic at taking a character through an enormous arc. We see so much growth in so many of her books and in this book we don't have that arc to follow. We don't have that character. We don't have that heart in general that we usually have in all the other books. There's a lot going on. I would say my favorite character is probably Ian. Is his name Ian? Ethan. It's probably Ethan, who is Connor's younger brother. The one that mentions Sunball every other fucking sentence. If I had to see Ian and Sunball together one more time, he compares every single thing to Sunball. It's like, we get it. Okay, you played Sunball and you were good at it. I, I understand. Is that the only thing you ever think about? And everyone always just compares him to Sunball. Like Bryce is like, looks at Ian, Ethan. Ethan and thinks Sunball. Everyone around him is like, oh, the Sunball player, the Sunball player, the Sunball player. <laughs> and guess what? There's no Sunball in this book. It's irrelevant. After this book, I feel like we might be on a sort of throne of glass story trajectory where the world opens up in a huge way in book three and kind of changes our perspective on a lot of things going on. So obviously we get a big world shift toward the end of House of Sky and Breath. I it's hard to talk about this book without spoilers. I'll just, overall thoughts. It's not my favorite Sarah J. Mass book. I did obviously enjoy myself because I love all her characters, but I feel like it was missing the like true heart of any one character to lead us through it in the endearing, I can't stop reading sort of way you usually plow through a Sarah J. Mass novel. I think that is like a big reason why I didn't get through it as 
fast as I wanted to because I would pick it up again and there was just no one character that was really going through it. It was a lot of setup. There's was a lot of sex. <laughs> Which led me to think we were foreshadowing something that also didn't end up happening in this book. So I'm, I'm really curious as to what the next book's gonna be like. I think it's gonna blow open some doors. I think we are going to maybe get another love interest for Bryce. I'm hoping. Don't hit me with anything. <laughs> It feels like it's time. We're gonna be spoiling now, so just leave if you don't wanna be spoiled, okay? It's been so long, like I feel like everyone's read it except me. Since Bryce and Hunt are together already, there was no tension there. In the beginning of the book, there's this like no sex pact, which I was confused about. I was like, why? It, like the reasoning didn't really make sense. Like they wanted to get to know each other some more, even though I feel like they know each other pretty intimately about the first book. I don't know, okay? There's so much, so many sex scenes after we hit the midpoint of the book that I was almost like, okay, I think I'm just gonna die at the end of this book. I think that would have brought me an enormous emotional punch at the end. And because I predicted the exact end, I got there and I was like, oh. Just like I said, I was like, oh. <laughs> like I just wanted more at the end because I wasn't surprised by anything. Whereas I just rewatched the Crescent City one book talk and I was surprised by literally everything in the best way. And all like my head, my head, my brain foreshadowing theories, like enough of them came true that it was incredibly satisfying and enough of them were like twisted on its head that it was blown out of the water. It, it's, it's so hard to keep doing that. And I just think that this suffered from too many, too much going on. Like I would continually forget who people were. And okay, granted, I read this over a very, very long period of time. So that aided in that. But I don't know, there were so many new names that it was hard to keep track of every character. Let's take a look at my notes. Which I started 328, 2022. We opened the novel with Sophie Renast. I really also am kind of confuzzled about this storyline because I really wanted Sophie to come back into play. I really wanted a meal to come into play but they were mostly a giant misdirect. Sophie ended up dying even though I was so sure I was like she can't be dead. Like the hind couldn't have actually killed her. She made it and then we got hints that maybe she did make it and then she didn't make it. <laughs> And that really was upsetting. That was an upsetting storyline to me, especially when Emil didn't have powers. Maybe it's a double misdirect and he does and we'll find out in the next book. But as of right now, everyone's like, he's just a kid. And I don't think the Viper Queen would have let him go if she thought that he had more abilities. So I'm kind of confused about this and very upset about it. I really loved the fact that Cormac was in love with her and then we never got to see that come to fruition and Cormac just explodes at the end of the book. He sacrifices himself for the cause. Like, I just wasn't a fan of that storyline and it really kept getting me down. Like she's a thunderbird, which is so interesting. And we never really got to explore that power at all. What it means and how it relates to Hunt. From rewatching my Crescent City One book talk, I saw that it seems like he is the product of a hell prince and an angel getting together and having kids. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean for Thunderbirds? Like, how did that power come to be? Like, are they related in some way? I just wish we got to hang out with Sophie Renas. She opens the book and then she's just dead. And then her brother is in the book in the opening and he's just a kid. <laughs> like, I just feel like we didn't get any payoff there. I know Sophie like was working with Danica, but we didn't get any payoff there either. Sophie got the information that the Asteri Archangels are the top of the food chain and they're living off of everyone here and they've been devouring different worlds and they need first light to live. That didn't come so much as a shock to me. It kind of makes sense in a way that wasn't like, <gasps> in a way that I was like, yeah, I mean, it kind of feels like it because they're the top of the food chain. It makes the world make more sense in a fascinating way. Like, oh, okay, they brought everyone in here so that they could kind of breed their food almost, you know? So they have a place to eat always because they go to conquer other worlds. They have this base. And it feels like, since it's called Midgard, I would assume that this started off as like Earth. 
I don't know why I just said Earth, but like Earth, because Earth is Midgard in Norse mythology. And then they brought all of these different creatures here because they're like, oh, they can rule over the humans and they'll be happy because they they have their own little hierarchy. And so much so that it will distract them from us being the hierarchy over them. The first light situation is still not clear to me. I mean, like making the drop, how that works. Maybe I have to reread the first book. I don't understand what's happening there. Like I know, because she's like, we have to stop making the drop. But I thought the drop was to to, like cement your immortality. Is that like a lie? I don't really understand how the Asteri are making them do that to gain their immortality. Like are the Asteri gifting them the immortality then? Is is the immortality not, is that not part of like what gives you the immortality? Making the drop into your power and then like finding your way back out of it? I, I forget the details there. I just don't really get why it was such a concern where Connor is and where all the devils are because they they passed and I guess they look at death differently. The amount of concern Ethan is showing an obsession over like talking to his brother and warning him. I'm like warning him about what? Like isn't he dead? Like I, I don't I don't get it. When they say they're eternally resting, are they not resting? Are they just living in a different realm? Like the way they think about death is so confusing to me and the, the characters who have passed are still so prominent in the plot that I kept thinking like there has to be more here. Are we gonna get them back? Like are they not actually dead? Is death not the same? Like are they not just gone? Why are they risking their lives to go to all these different places to talk to Connor? Connor's passed and you're gonna die doing this. What are you gonna warn him? If this is just a fact of life that the Under King runs off of their souls, it seems like to me, a human on earth, it seems like that is the natural cycle of life. Because like people die and their bodies nourish the earth and then more stuff grows. Like that's literally what happens. That's what's happening here. It's just framed differently. So I just kept getting so confused. Like they kept bringing up Connor. So it like led me to believe that we're foreshadowing like these characters coming back into the fold. Because we got like a full arc for Danica in book one. And the fact that she's like still a prime character and this just kept, like, I kept laughing. I kept just being like, wow, Danica strikes again. Like twist after twist after twist. Honestly, Danica's twists were my favorite twist. Danica is like my favorite character in Crescent City and she's been dead since the first 50 pages. I wish I got to know her. Danica to me is Selena Sardathian. It says Selena Sardathian written all over it. All over it. She even looks like her. And like a little part of me started hoping hoping that like maybe Danica's not dead. Even though there's been so much it's important heavy drama about her death and growth and also Bryce traded her soul for so Danica would have a place to rest. Danica like the spark of her is what allowed Bryce to make it out of the drop. Like all of that happened. So Danica can't be alive. <laughs> like. The fact that all book two is still the secrets of Danica part two is mind boggling, is it not? And it was mind boggling to me that at the end of this, we didn't ever talk to Connor. I was so confused. We had that whole thing with Hypaxia and Ian. He made a deal that he'd guard her at the ball for Ethereum and Celestina if she talked to Connor, cause she's a necromancer. So the fact that she's a necromancer also made me believe that we were going some place where we're gonna like raise the dead. And now that we've put so much time into Danica and Connor, I'm like, are we gonna raise them? Is there like an alternate universe where they're gonna be alive? We're jumping worlds. It almost is to the point where like, if we don't see Connor again, it's not gonna be satisfied. I'm so confused. This is not normal behavior, but no one's addressing it as like, this is something we should be worried about. Ethan is still really, really harping on Connor's death. Like maybe we should get him in therapy. Maybe someone should talk to him. Everyone's acting like this is normal. So this is normal. Where's it going? Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> I did really like Ethan's storyline with the astrology guy, the astronomer. The astronomer was very interesting. I love the whole lore and mystery of him and of the, the mystics he has in the tanks and how they're kind of traveling to all these other worlds. I liked the storyline how one of them was a wolf and it ended up being the Fendir heir. So Sabine might have a sister, or like a half sister or something. And she could be the new prime instead of Sabine. So even though Danica's gone, maybe like I, I'm almost like, is Danica gonna show the fuck up in another book? Like, is she 
like is does she have a foil Danica in another realm? Like I I don't know, man. I don't know. There's just so much Danica presence. It's now getting to be weird. Not weird. Like weird. Like is this foreshadowing weird? <laughs> weird. Like is there more to this circle? Weird. I don't think we're done with Danica. Sophie in the beginning says something about her brother also having the gift, but it's not as strong. And she's not saying it to anyone. So you would think that Emil does have the gift. Just like this whole storyline drove into the ground. It just disappeared because we didn't even get the satisfaction of finding a meal. We just had one of those like runarounds where those mess arounds where Bryce had already figured it out on her own and we just found out through Hunt and he had already found him with Viper Queen and made a deal with her and it was so out of left field. Like sometimes this works but this didn't work for me in this one because it was such a big storyline. We spent so much time harping on it and it just went we're done. He's getting adopted by her parents and it's fine. Everything's done. He doesn't have any powers. He's just human. It's too suspicious. Okay. He's not just human. I don't buy it. This book ended with nothing closed. We opened up a lot of loops and they just kind of died or stayed open and loose. Whereas in Crescent City, again, like all the loops that were important to us, came full circle. They were so satisfying. There were still so many unanswered loops, but those were more subtle plants, not the big overlaying stories, but this felt like the big overlying story. We never checked on him again. We kind of shut it down when Cormac questioned it. I really wanted Cormac to have his Sophie Renast reunion. Like I was invested in that relationship and it just went I also thought there was going to be more drama with Cormac being engaged to Bryce. And that also just kind of got resolved very quickly. The C says her brother is just as gifted as she is, but and he's 13. Wait, what is the C? What is this note I wrote? Emil has powers. This is so confusing. So we have this new archangel that's assigned to their city, Celestina. She really gives us ally vibes, but at the end, it's weird. Like, I don't know if the archangels are just trying to turn them against Celestina. But he basically says that she's been talking to them all along, so she's not your friend. But Celestina's with Hypaxia. I ship them and I, I, I'm so confused. Like, again, I'm like, I'm so confused. I'm waiting for another love interest because I'm bored of her and Hunt. As bad as that sounds, I am. And we learn a lot about Cormac. So he almost murdered Rune back in the day in the quest for the Starborn Sword. He has shadow abilities, but they're different from Rune's. Okay, one of the things that I found most shocking was the fact that Rune and Rysand look a ton alike because I was just not picturing them looking alike at all. What? What are you saying? Rysand and Rune are related? For some reason, Rune has red hair in my head. I don't picture him with like blue violet eyes. I don't know. But the fact that they like might share ancestry was such a shocker to me when in that final chapter like there was one thing that made me go what in that chapter and it was the rune part like rune is that you but it's rice and <laughs> So I don't remember if we learned this in Crescent City or if we learned this here, but the Oracle told Rune that the royal bloodline ends with you, Prince. By the end of it, he's like, maybe that didn't mean that like I die. Maybe it means that it's you're the queen now. Like you start the new bloodline. I have a big note that says, when are we going to kill off the motherfucking Autumn King? Because <laughs> he said your sister has one value to me. Her breeding potential is fucking douchebag. Ew. <laughs> That's my note. And then when are we gonna fucking kill him off? When are we? He again didn't end up playing much of a role in this. We didn't really see any kickback from her defying him in front of everybody. Cause technically Rune says that she now outranks him. She has more power than him. Is that what it is? I feel very wishy-washy cause there was just so much that it was impossible to take it all in. Cormac has a star mark just like Quinlan does. And at one point he says that they both have them because they're predestined to be together. But we actually find out at the end of the novel that there are beacons to their previous planet, <laughs> their previous ancestry. So whenever they're around someone who shares that ancestry, the star will glow. And whenever they're around like trusted loyal allies, it will also glow. Now, I don't know what that means. Like, does it glow if you trust them or does it glow if like you can trust them? Cause there's a big distinction there. Therion, 
has sold himself to the Viper Queen. And now I'm like, we cannot trust him. And he is in their midst. That was like the dumbest decision I've ever heard. I'm still mad about it. It's like the thing that I'm most angry about with this book is that Therion sold himself to the River Queen. Because I'm a big fan of Therion, okay? He's a very interesting character. And he's got a lot of gray areas, but ultimately he's a good person. He's another one that really shined in this book. It was Ethan and Therion. And I loved when they were working together. To escape the River Queen, he put pledges himself to the Viper Queen and he has to drink her blood to do so and he's gonna be like a fighter for her and it, he, he sold himself to her. He's now a slave to the Viper Queen. By drinking her blood, it's kind of like a vampire when you have a sire. There's a connection there where he has to obey her. And that's fucking scary. Like now the Viper Queen has a straight line to everything that's going on with Bryce and her friends. Like she's just got like a cell phone, an ear there at all times because it sounds like she knows exactly what he's doing at all times. She was like getting the fucking war. Oh my God, we didn't get to see if he got to the water. We didn't even see if Therion made it to water at the end. He needed two to two hours to get in water or else he was gonna lose his gills. <sighs> That's where my notes end. I have a few more on my phone that I kind of covered in like my instantaneous reactions. I'll just play those right now. I'm in the last three hours of the audiobook of Crescent City House of Sky and Breath. Danica had a mate that she didn't tell Bryce about and that mate is the hellhound and he has the tattoo. Everything is possible through love. All is possible in her handwriting across his chest and he's just like casually mad mentions it now? I don't, what were you doing all this other time? I could have gone forever without picturing Hunt's balls slapping Bryce's ass. I could have, I didn't need that. If I have to hear him reference his aching cock one more time, I don't know if I can make it. Everyone in this book is so horny. I've never experienced such levels. Every other second of my life, one of them is each other. Tharion is talking to an unnamed leopard shifter at the party. Is it Lysandra? Because that's all I can think about. All I can think about. They had sex last night too. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Hunt just said that the triangle of Bryce's thong was a veritable arrow pointing towards paradise. <laughs> I can't handle these sentences. I can't handle them. Tharion just sold himself to the Viper Queen to escape the River Queen. This is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. If I ever knew a bad idea. What is, what? Why didn't you consult with anyone before making this dumb, dumb decision? Face table, face table, face table. That's me doing that thing where it's like asterisks. Face table, <laughs> face table. The wolf in the mystic tank is another Fendir heir. Sabine's sister or something. The prime was like, did she smell of snow and ember? <laughs> Did the lady you had sex with smell of snow and ember? I'm trying to imagine the smell of snow and ember. It feels like an oxymoron because if there was fire for embers, then there would be no snow. I guess, okay, it must be the smell of when you put a lump of snow over a fire to put it out. I cracked it. And now Ian is going to go try to protect her. And I don't know, help her become the heir. Can I just say something? So from the beginning of this book, there's so much hunt. Hunt, I love you. Hunt, there's just so much hunt sex that I just, he, I feel like he's gonna die at the end of this book. I've been waiting for something to happen to him since the beginning of Crescent City time because of, you know, Sarah loves to switch up the love interest. I feel like we're planting Ian or like Connor's gonna rise from the dead. We're talking a lot about Connor for a character that's dead. Day and Rune are having sex in their mind land and he just, just said that her inner muscles clenched milking him. <laughs> I can't handle it. Milking him. Does that not shoot you into her uterus? That's all. I'm seeing her milking the sperm from him. And I don't want to see it. I don't want that image. No rude. No milking. Danica. We found out Danica is a bloodhound. Which means that she can sniff out your ancestry. Which is really fascinating. And again, would love to know her ancestry. And she was hunting it down. And it's going to be important. And again, I'm like, is Danica not dead? I we obviously have this new Fendir wolf. So we're hopefully gonna get to know more about her as she acclimates. I'm just even confused as to like, 
how the next book's gonna go because I feel like I've seen Sarah writing the next Crescent City and not the next Akamath book. I'm just gonna look it up right now. Yeah, House of Flame and Shadow is coming January 30th. So we have no news of Silver Flame. So this leads me to believe that we're gonna see next from Bryce's point of view. I don't know if the book is going to be her owning her powers finally. So she keeps hearing from Hell in this book that she needs to hone her powers. And we saw in the previous book that she has a relationship with one of the princes of Hell, Aedis. Aedis. They're kind of friends. They've worked together. And so we don't really question these princes of Hell talking to her. But in actuality, it was just one of the Asteri pretending to be a prince of Hell because they wanted her to hone her powers so that they could use her to open the gates. Because back in the day, that famous starborn princess closed off the gates, I guess using the horn, and locked all of the Asteri here on this planet. They'd have no way to open the doors to travel between worlds anymore to conquer more worlds. They need that horn to open shit back up so that they can continue to move around the universe. But the Fae overpowered the Asteri when the Asteri tried to conquer their world. The world that Rysand lives in did not let the Asteri take over. They had enough power to withstand and hold their ground. We have a lot of creatures in that world from those really intense times that I'm like, are they Asteri that just didn't get any first light to feed on? You know, like that monster in the basement of the library in like Court of Wings and Ruins and like, was that an old Asteri that was gonna eat her? You know, it was the weaver an old Asteri that wanted to eat her. You know, it was, was the bone carver an old Asteri? Is Armin an old Asteri that like took the form of a fae? I'm very interested in knowing more now that we know more because that happened 15,000 years ago. Okay, and Armin has been around for all Amrin. Armin, Amrin, is it Amrin? Amran has been around for all of what it. What I didn't like, what like really frustrated me reading that last chapter was like, it took her so long to realize she's not in hell. Which, okay. I know it would take her a little bit, but for me, as soon as she opened a portal, I'm like, she's not portaling to hell. She doesn't know how to open a portal. In the first book, when Micah uses her to open a portal, he opens the portal to hell. He doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Hell defeated the Asteri, and they want to defeat the Asteri once and for all. Like, they want the Asteri to be conquered and gone. So now she wants to open the portal to hell, and she opens it to her ancestry. I feel like the star chose where she was going to go, because she, she landed right in their hands. I feel like Aziriel was the one holding the knife to her neck and that took her to the house of I'm assuming the House of Wind and Breath, but it could be one of their other houses. I don't fucking know. She speaks the old language of the Fae. I just don't like the language barrier. Like, I guess I know it makes sense that there's different languages on different fucking worlds, okay? Like, the Fae language of 15,000 years ago is no longer relevant, but I'm just scared of reading a book where there's a language barrier and it's a pain in the ass. I want to be able to hear what our characters are saying. That was so frustrating. Like, everyone comes in, they're talking to each other, and she doesn't know what they're saying. Amran is gonna have to, what, translate for her all the time, or maybe she can pick up the language, I don't know. We do know that they have the harp. In A Court of Silver Flames, they are acquiring the Death Trove, which are three very powerful magical items that were made in the cauldron. They're like all magical gods. Nesta was made and these items were made. So that's why Nesta is able to help find the items. There's the mask, there's the harp, and there's the crown. The crown enables you to have mind control over everyone around you. The harp lets you open any door. And there's 26 strings and there's 26 worlds. It also can let you freeze time, like she freezes time at the end. And she also has made her own death trove. She makes like three weapons and she imbues them without even realizing it with like some of her power that's inside of her from the cauldron. So she still has all these different powers. The most important one being the harp. So Bryce is now in the Rysand world. We don't have a name for this world. Like I'm just calling it Rysand world. <laughs> Rysand world. She's in Rysand world. She's like, I have no way to get back. No one's gonna be able to charge me up. I don't know how I feel about her having to be charged up to use her powers. I hope she finds an alternate way to use them. I feel like she just hasn't really dug into how that works. And you know who's really good at digging into how powers work? The Night Court crew. <laughs> so I'm like, is this next book going to be delving into that? Or are we going to be going to hell? Jaseba has connections with the princes of hell. And Jaseba obviously was keeping that whole library that had all the information about history that was illegal because the archangels don't want anyone to know this information. So does she know all this about 
the Asteria already. And is she already in cahoots with the princes to try to overthrow them? What is the House of Flame and Shadow? The Archangels eat the first light, but also the Under King said he eats the first light. Or the second light. Reapers, wraiths, vampires, drakey, dragons. Okay, they also brought this dragon woman in. Ariadne is her name. We don't really get to know her. I was excited to like understand her more. She's been enslaved in one of the astronomers' rings. That storyline really just, like, there's too much going on. I thought we were gonna get to know these three women and we really did not at all. They were let out of the rings and now they're like living with Rune and his crew. We have no idea who they are and the dragon escaped and now is working for the Viper Queen. And when Therion sells himself to the Viper Queen, she's like, are you mad? So I feel like she did this as a last resort and now Therion's stuck in there. I don't know if they're gonna form a bond. Is there a romance that's gonna stir there? I don't know. I would enjoy that actually. <laughs> I wanna know her. At first you kind of just look at her as an animal because they keep calling her a dragon but she's a person just like everyone else is with an ability to turn into a dragon. She's a shifter. She's that type of fae. So we talk about different type of fae from different worlds and maybe they evolved from the same Rysand world, but on a different world, they evolved new powers and they all have an animal form. And that's very reminiscent of like Tamlin and his abilities, right? The spring court. They somehow got to another world with all these doors that could be opened and evolved as their own spin-off species of fae. And I would think that a dragon also evolved from that line of fae. She's just a shifter. So many of these people are just shifters, like the wolves and the archangels kind of turned them all against each other by giving them different species names so that they wouldn't bond together, but they're all just just fey. Necromancers and many wicked and unnamed things that even Erd herself cannot see. That's the House of Flame and Shadow. So I don't know. There's just, there's so much ground to cover. And I hope that we focus in more on character in the next book. The only part of this book that made me emotional was Hunt being re-enslaved by the Asteri. That was fucking rough. I'm excited for the next book. I'm excited to see what happens now that our worlds have collided. I'm just, I really want a new love interest thrown in the mix, okay? Like, a, the Hunt doesn't have to die, but like, she's stuck in a different world for a long time. Is she gonna be stuck in Rysand world the whole time in book three? If we have the harp, it should be easy to travel around. Like, maybe they'll instantly use the harp to go to hell and meet Adis. And like, I, I think there would be a really nice circular moment if her and Adis started actually having a relationship because, oh yeah, I was talking about her ancestor, the other Starborn who fell in love with someone from Hell and ended up locking out all of Hell when she locked out all of the Asteri from the, her Feyland, you know? So they were all stuck here. During that time, I'm sure like other Hell princes and Hell people, I had mated with other people and created a lot of these like creatures. It's such a hodgepodge of different types of species on Crescent City and it's kind of, it's beautiful in that way, but it's also very uneven power wise. There's such a domineering class system and obviously that has to end. Are we gonna get Selena involved? Is Selena Danica in another realm? <laughs> could be related to Selena. The possibilities are kind of endless there because we don't know how that connect, but we know that there are word keys and shit. It feels like if we're gonna tie together these two worlds, I know we don't really wanna bother Aelin, okay? We don't, but there's a lot over there that we didn't really resolve. Like, what's Dorian doing? What's everyone doing? <laughs> what will House of Flame and Shadow be? Like, it's so much to think that we'll be both in Rysand world and in Crescent City, right? Like. That's just a mind fuck. It's a mind fuck to try to even think about it. And obviously that's gonna come first. And what does that mean for the Rysand world, right? Because they have this greater evil Koshi that's coming and Rysand and Feyre are like struggling with the idea of having to take up a king and queenship of all of Perinthian to unite them against this greater evil. And we don't really understand this greater evil, this Koshi wizard guy who's stuck in a lake. I don't know, it's gonna be really interesting to see how it progresses now that Bryce has ties to them is she going to help with that i would have thought that maybe she would have like been stuck there through their book then we would have got house and flame house of flame and shadow but house of flame and shadow is coming first so like i don't know are they all gonna be working together for the rest of time like is she gonna visit with them now that she has like she has a horn in her back so once she masters it will she be able to like jump worlds so easily
easily. And they have their harp, so is it easy? Or like, is there a toll that comes with using this magic that's too intense for them to travel all the time? There's so much. I'm overwhelmed. And that's how I felt throughout the entire book. Oh, I didn't even talk about Rune and Day. I was really invested in Rune and Day. I was very excited. And then like, it passed through my mind that it could be the hind at one point. But she was so nice that I was like, that doesn't really make sense. But as soon as he went to meet her at that party and the hind was the only other person other than the harpy, I was like, it's her. And I, the fact that he didn't even think that it could be her really. And then we didn't really get to see them more. I, he locked her out of her his brain at the end. I just, I wish there was more of an epilogue there. Like nothing had an epilogue. The epilogue was just Ethan going to get the wolf out of the tank at the astronomer's place, which, how did he get in there? Now that it's been broken into a million times, you'd think he'd have really intense security. <laughs> he just like went in, he's like, wake up. And she opens her eyes. And that was like the big ending. I wanted to see Rune talk to Lydia. Where is Lydia from? What is her backstory? I just feel unresolved in a lot of different things. Like my favorite part for a lot of this book was the Rune day meetings. And then I didn't, wasn't surprised when it was Lydia at the end. And then Rune like, didn't have a full arc with her. I just want someone to have a full arc. Like we need a full arc of something at the end of a book, you know, to feel satisfied. I'm really excited for the next book. I feel like she's now like set a lot of things up. I can only imagine the amount of pressure there was trying to set up so many different storylines. So much so that like there's no time. This is so big. There's no time to bring anything to the end because there were so many. One of the reasons why Court of Silver Flames is so good is because we only focus on really two characters. And I love that and I hope that there's a narrower focus in the next book. I feel like Ethan is being set up as a love interest. I'm, okay, I'm a sucker for brothers in love with the same girly. If you listen to my podcast, I've talked about it a bunch with Natasha on there. Like the trope of two brothers being in love with the same girl, like the Vampire Diaries. Oh, it's my favorite. Ethan had a big crush on Bryce before Connor even met her and like feeling this tug and thinking they were mates. Suspicious to me. And he says he still doesn't feel that way, but at the end, the first thing he says is like, Bryce, is she okay? Is she okay? Is she okay? Is she okay? And I'm like, her and Hunt aren't actually mates. They decided to be mates. They didn't have like a thing that snapped into place. And that's like what we've learned mate things is. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean you love them, but this bond snaps into place. And it feels like Ethan felt that. And I like Ethan. And he's really coming into the forefront of our character group. So. It would be really interesting if she forged a, a sort of romantic like chemistry bond with someone in the rice and world. I don't want her to cheat on Hunt, but like considering the circumstances, there could be tension with somebody. Every one of Sarah's characters has lots of love interests. I want like someone from hell. <laughs> I want Idis in her. What if she gets involved with like Azuriel? <laughs> I think it would be really sweet if something happened with Ethan and she started to see him in a new light for some fucking reason. I don't know. There's so much. There's so much. So I'm gonna wrap this up. I, please share your thoughts, okay? I hope the best for Hunt. I want him to be happy and I'm very upset about what's going on. I feel like someone had to die in this novel and Cormac is like the new character that we don't really care about, especially since he doesn't have any ties to anyone. And without that emotional punch, it didn't feel satisfying because they were in such high stakes. Maybe I'm being too harsh on these characters. I just did not feel satisfied. I want the punch. I know we've, I know Danica's not there. Like Danica was a huge loss. But that's part of what made Crescent City so powerful is that she was gone. That all those characters we bonded with in the beginning were gone, taken away. Without something that powerful in the second book, emotionally, we did not have the same room to grow in our mentally. And it doesn't have to be a death, but there was no blow like that. The blow maybe was Sophie not being alive, but none of them knew Sophie. <gasps> I'm Christine. I have two novels out and my third one should be coming up for pre-order sometime in the next few months. And I, I'm so excited to talk more about my it. My first book's called A Game of Better. My second book's called Better Together. And if you are interested in checking them out, there's links in the description below. And I'd really appreciate your support there. I'm on Instagram as Addict and Twitter as Addict and TikTok and all the places. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Christine and I will see you next time.